who is uh, executive director of the Cumberland Museum and Archives. Rosalind, who has a degree in public policy and criminal justice from the University of Guelph, completed her museum studies at the University of Victoria. She joined the Cumberland Museum and Archives in March of uh, 2020. In her presentation, with grits, guts, and resilience, Roz will take us on a narrative adventure that explores the interwoven lives of women in Cumberland from the days of coal mining to present day. In the face of extreme adversity, racism, and alienation, the women of Cumberland have continued to advocate for positive change. And here's Roz. Hello, ladies. Thank you so much for having me and Sonia for inviting me this evening. Um, uh, please do feel free to raise your hands at any point if you have questions and um, or just interrupt. I'm fine with that as well. Um, so like Sonia said, I've been with the Cumberland Museum for a little over a year now, almost going on a year and a half. And it's been a wonderful adventure. We have actually only just reopened our doors uh, November uh, 4th. <clears throat> we were closed for an entire year for a full-scale building infrastructure upgrade and exhibition revitalization. So there's been uh, lots going on uh, at the museum uh, over this past year. So it's really exciting to engage with the public again and be back open. So I am going to just figure out, uh, bear with me please, how to change my slide in this multiple presentation view I've got going on. There we go. Um, so I just wonder, um, you can, if you've ever used the little raise your hand icon, has everybody or anyone been to the Cumberland Museum and Archives or been to Cumberland before? Yes, a few people, great. <laughs> um, so many of you will know that uh, we were a coal mining town um in its early uh, rendition and we've sort of been rebranded as the uh, village in the forest and i'm going to take you on a little bit of an adventure um through the women who have uh, called cumberland home and talk about the impacts that they've had on our community but before i do that i'd love to share with you some of the women that i have the pleasure of working with currently and I'm gonna, there we go. So I hope that you can see my team here. Uh, so currently at the museum, there are four um, staff members, including myself. Um, on my left, I'm gonna assume maybe you're right. Uh, I have uh, Dr. Leah Taro. So she is the museum's curator. She joined the museum in October of last year. Um, and has had a huge hand in um, all the exhibition redevelopment that is uh, mainly her job, as well as caring for physical collection and archival um, documents. Uh, Leah just completed her PhD from SFU in museum ethics and archeology. span And then we've got Caroline Kasdan, who is our program development coordinator after being closed for a year and um, redoing all of our exhibitions, we are now creating all new programs at the museum. Um, so it's a really exciting project for Caroline to be working on um, thinking about how we can engage in group tours and group programming uh, with the public. And then Dawn Copeman, uh, is our program support and interpreter. She also writes all of our blogs for the, mu the museum on the website. She does walking tours and uh, just an all around uh, lovely local historian. And then there is myself. So that um, is our current team at the museum. Here we go. And so now on to our talk. And so one of the things I'd kind of like you to think about a little bit uh, as we go through the discussions and looking at all these women this evening is what does it take to you know, really push ourselves and what is it that our communities need and how can we help um, provide that and how have these women really stepped up um, in the community. And so that is partly why I've called it grits, guts, and resilience, because especially in that early coal mining town, you still really needed that, um, as you do today uh, in our community as well. 
So um, we are going to take a little look at early immigration um, to Cumberland. So similar to um, Nanaimo, um, you had um, the Dunsmuir um, uh, properties coming into uh, play here while Robert Dunsmuir, who many of you may know, um, actually came from Scotland in the 1850s and he worked uh, as a coal miner and he worked his way up um, and he had great um, success within the um, mining companies and he was able to build his own company. Um, he actually bought the land rights around what was then called Union, which is now Cumberland, um, prior to what we hear about often as the Great <coughs> um, So he actually purchased the rights to the land from earlier mining companies in the 1870s. Then he was given um, about 20% of Vancouver Island in the Great Land Grab, um, where he was supposed to build a railway from Esquimalt to Nanaimo, which didn't really happen, um, but he was given a very large sum of money and about 20% of the land on the Eastern side of Vancouver Island. And not just the land, but also the timber and the mineral rights. And so this gave him a really big leeway. And as you can see from the little diagram here <clears throat> in the center there, you can sort of see where Cumberland is and Union Camp. So Union was the sort of original um, settlement in Cumberland and this village itself, which actually was initially a city, it's now a village, um, was uh, developed. So the very first miners came in about 1887 and there was about 75 white miners and about 200 Chinese miners that came into the area to set up the initial camps took them about a year, uh, and then they had their first um, set of coal coming out after that. And I just want you to sort of think about what that environment might have been like. There was very little there. The first thing that you do at any settlement area is you actually set up a mill and you cut down the trees in order to build the camp um, and to build the infrastructure that's required. So you had um, sort of very, very um, rudimentary infrastructure happening. And I just wanted to um, read uh, from a book called Colonialization and Community by John Belshaw, a description of what early Cumberland was like. Cumberland was a dreary place the mushy earth between the miners' cottages punctuated with incompletely incinerated cedar stumps with immense proportions. The nearest neighborhood community was more than 10 miles away along an undulating road inexpertly carved out of the dark forest. Below the white miners' village, the Chinese community was huddled in an extension of shanty town at the edge of a swamp that regularly admitted disease carrying clouds of mosquitoes. So <laughs> I think John here gives a really good description of what that um, might have been like. Um, and so then when we think about who is coming into these places and um, the women who were sort of emigrating into this early settlement of a mining camp, and so really, when I think about the early women that came to this community, I imagine they must have been extremely strong-willed women to have left their families behind. Um, usually they were very young, early married. If you had a family already, you generally had boys, you weren't bringing daughters into this environment. And you had very little support system with a few other women about you. Um, so if we think about healthcare needs or support in the family when babies, early babies were being born, didn't really have a lot of women performing or so that mother or grandmother extended family relationships. And so I think when I imagine what that um, building a new life in an early coal mining town would have been like, these would have been some of the challenges being far away from 
from the family. Also thinking about how dangerous the work was for the men. Um, in the Nanaimo Free Press in February 9th, 1923, um, calls Cumberland a house of mourning where women go wailing through the streets for the loss of their loved ones. And there is ever a knot of men and women waiting at the undertaker's office to see who is born in the next. You know, it was, it was a horribly gassy um, series of lines and over um, 350 uh, individuals lost their lives in the years in which the mines were working. So it was a rather challenging environment um, to be growing into. So let's talk about our first early woman who I think had a lot of grit. I'm sure I can change my slide. There we go. Diana Day Pikett. Um, this <laughs> wonderful woman uh, came with uh, her husband. They were uh, originally from Nottingham, England, uh, and then they moved to Denman Island. Uh, she came with her husband, John Henry uh, Pikett, and they established a farm on Denman Island. They grew produce and they uh, raised livestock, but that wasn't enough for Diana. And in 1984, her and John uh, purchased the Cumberland Hotel and they built the Cumberland Hall next door. Uh, so rather industrious um, of them at that time. And this was the time still when an, um, really the village of Cumberland was just expanding. So you were only just having boarding houses going up in that area. Soon after opening the hotel, um, they separated. <laughs> and the description of camp at that time was, there were a few buildings uh, scattered among a set of stumps. And um, so that's the area in which they were building uh, their hall. Um, and they built the hall because Diana was really interested in engaging in social activities. Um, and she was really became quite the, the host. Um, so after they separated, she ran the Cumberland Hotel all by herself. Um, she had a couple people work through different time periods as a manager. Um, but for 17 years, she ran it. And the census for uh, 19 or sorry for 1891 um, has her having the largest boarding house in Union with 16 lodgers. They were all British uh, and they were uh, coal miners with the exception of two. Uh, one was a foreman and one was a locomotive engineer. Um, and there's quotes that describe Diana as uh, running her boarding house with her own brand of loving care and strong discipline. So I have um, an, a suspicion uh, that um, there was a curfew and there was a limit to the time in which the men could be still drinking um, after certain hours. Perhaps uh, her strict uh, rules and regulations um, was part of the reason for her separation with John because just down the street uh, in uh, Royston, he purchased his own inn and then uh, it was kind of colloquially known as the halfway house and it definitely had a different feel to it. You might want to call it a brothel perhaps um, at that time where you could get a bed for 75 cents and uh, sorry, 25 cents for a bed and 75 cents uh, got you two, two meals. But according to legend, um, it was set afire by a horde of angry women who did not like his establishment. Uh, and then he was in debt after that and lost most of his money. <laughs> um, so she was really known as quite the character. After, um, and the next slide, this is a, an image of the old Cumberland Hotel, and then you can see the hall beside that from 1900. And you can see that on the two advertisements um, pulled from the newspaper, 
that she is listed as the proprietor on the, um, he is on the one and then she is on the second one. So it's, um, you know, really interesting to see that you would see very few women having their name listed as the proprietor of an establishment um, in, the, in those days, just at the turn of the century. So uh, she did remarry. She remarried a man named uh, Jack Bruce, but unfortunately he died um, just a year after um, they were married. When she did decide to retire from running the hotel, uh, she bought a property in Cumberland at 3312 5th in 1909, and she renamed it the Belvoir Villa. And she hosted garden parties to aid the Red Cross, and um, she was part of the Women's Auxiliary as, um, that worked to support the Cumberland Hospital. Uh, just another little interesting fact about her, if you want to visit the Cumberland Cemetery, she is buried in between her two husbands. And uh, the Twisted Chimney for a time, her old house was actually uh, a bed and breakfast. House is still standing, you can still see it. Um, the next woman I'd like to talk about is Lydia Finch. Um, really like the story of Lydia Finch. Um, she was born in 1883. Um, she's known as Mrs. Finch or Aunt Kay to generations of children in Cumberland. She was um, born in England in a middle-class Victorian uh, household. She came to uh, Canada to Victoria to visit some friends in 1910, and then she met her husband, uh, Lewis Howard Finch. He was a carpenter. Um, they married, and they lived all over the Lower Mainland, and then they settled in um, in Cumberland. And for 35 years, um, Catherine was the organist and choir mistress at the Holy Trinity Anglican Church in Cumberland. She was also a really big part of the local music scene. Um, so in those days, she helped to foster the Cumberland Folk Festival that ran from 1949 to 1958. One of the things that I think is the most interesting about Catherine was her work with, um, with the Chinese population. So I've circled her there in red, so you can sort of see. So beyond just the work that she did with the Anglican church, she worked with the Chinese mission church as well. And she would go and she would teach Sunday school and she would teach piano lessons. And it had the wonderful experience of um, just uh, not too long after I had started at the Cumberland Museum, uh, Cumberland descendant Jack Chow uh, came to visit. And we asked him, it was his 90th birthday, and he came with his a whole family, a, a troop of them, about 30 people came to visit to, to see him here on his 90th birthday. And Dawn uh, was interviewing him and said, oh, do you remember, you know, Aunt Kay? And his face lit up and he was just beaming and he said, yes, you know, I got to go to her house for dinner. And he's like, it was a special invitation. Not everybody got to go to Aunt Kay's house. And so she would teach the Chinese uh, students piano lessons, 15 minute sessions only, and then on to the next. Um, and then she would teach English and needlepoint and painting and art as well. When you think about the time period in which she was doing this, there was a lot of racism between communities. Um, and so she was really working to bridge that barrier and really became somebody in the community who stood up for the Chinese population and provided support um, to mothers and women and the children. So much so that um, she is invited one uh, on the right side here is a birthday party. And then she was always a part of the Chinese reunions as well um, that happened, still happen um, within the Chinese community for the Chinese Cumberland uh, Picnic Association. <clears throat> I'd also like to point out 
um, two, you know, talk about two Chinese women. So um, the woman circled here is Peng Shi. Peng Shi is the second wife of Chao Feng Gar. What I think is, is interesting um, about the Chinese women that ended up coming um, with either generally after their husbands because of the head tax uh, and the exclusion act for Chinese individuals, the strength to come to a place where the majority of them didn't even speak English when they first came and to come into a completely foreign place you recall from the earlier description, they're literally living in a swamp. Um, now, Pong Shi had a little bit of a benefit in that Chao Fangar, her husband in the center there, uh, was an extremely successful businessman within Cumberland and in Victoria. And he owned a number of buildings as well as um, was part of the Chinese Freemasons, um, and so she probably had a fairly comfortable place uh, at that time, but um, she also um, sort of had an interesting place as being the second wife. Um, she came and she ended up acting as a midwife within the community for um, the other Chinese women. For few, there were very few at that time. Um, so I, I find that, you know, just thinking about the strength that that would take um, coming into a completely foreign place, having never have met your husband, actually, um, she was selected for him uh, and uh, sent over. They ended up having uh, five children. Then we have Dear Shi. Um, Dear Shi married uh, Chao Li. You can see uh, him there. And they also had five children. And Jack Chao was one of her children, who I had just mentioned earlier talking about Miss K. Um, Chao Li uh, was, or sorry, Dear Shi was Chao Li's third wife. His first two wives died. Um, and then she came again, also not speaking any English, um, and she was one of the uh, first women that was able to come uh, without the head having to pay a head tax um, because her husband, uh, Chow Lee, was one of the first naturalized Canadian citizens, um, so she was exempt for that reason. The next individual, oops, uh, unfortunately, Hong Lin, I don't have a photograph of her, um, but you can see Miss Finch here with three uh, Chinese students in front of the Mission Church. Um, Hong Lin was um, married to Mao Seng, and he was the first um, uh, reverend within the Chinese community. And he met his wife actually back in China in Canton, where he was going to missionary school. He had been a miner in the Cumberland Mines and he had been injured, was no longer able to work. So the English uh, reverend at the, um, uh, the one of the other local churches uh, sort of encouraged him to go into practice and he went back to um, China in order to um, fulfill that. He was one of the first um, Canadian Chinese baptized um, and then became a minister and moved back with um, Hong Lin to Cumberland. And when Hong Lin got there, um, she had been studying with the Anglican Ladies College in Canton. So she had um, this really unique opportunity of she was already fairly fluent in English before she came. And then she was able to gain additional income for their family by teaching English to uh, other Chinese women. For a time, they lived in Victoria and she taught. Cantonese um, to missionary women that were coming into Chinese communities um, to 
um, sort of spread the word of the church in those communities. Um, so it was an interesting sort of role reversal that we see there with her. Um, but a really important part of um, the Cumberland community, they were supporters of Dr. Sun Yat-sen and part of the nationalist movement. Uh, there was quite a flurry of activity in Cumberland uh, and there was a lot of money raised for Dr. Sun Yat-sen. Um, and Mao Sen's uh, son remembers his mother and father in 1911 creating the national flag in Cumberland and um, flying it outside of the church in support, which sort of creates an interesting picture um, of what that was like. But it was her sort of connection between the Chinese culture and heritage and tradition, and then her ability to adapt, um, having been part of the Anglican uh, Ladies College in China. She created a maiden house. And so when women of Chinese uh, descent were coming into the community, she sort of worked to act as a little bit of a matchmaker uh, and was able to connect people um, together and sort of move, help move Chinatown out of this sort of bachelor society that um, had developed when the head tax was there and very few uh, Chinese uh, men could bring their families and usually came over single. Another very famous woman, Aiko Seito, um, was of Japanese uh, descent. She was born in Cumberland in 1909, um, and she wanted to be a dentist, which seems like a little bit of an unusual uh, occupation for a woman. She did not end up becoming a dentist, but a very famous opera singer. Unfortunately, her father died. Uh, in the Cumberland Mines when she was only four and her mother remarried. Um, but she grew up around the number one Japanese town in Cumberland. Um, but she moved to Vancouver in order to attend high school. And it was after completing high school that she um, decided to move to Toronto and um, study at the Conservancy of Music um, there. She graduated in 1932 uh, with her diploma and she went on to perform all over the world, um, which was you know, sort of really interesting for a small uh, town for her to be, have had those opportunities to move on. When um, she was looking to um, travel and after she'd completed school and she sort of needed funds in order to um, go abroad and sing and participate in uh, different operas, um, the community in Cumberland rallied behind her and fundraised uh, in order for her to be able to meet the financial needs that, that she was um, going to Need. And so when she came back to Canada, she would always come back to Cumberland and she would perform there. And um, one of her, I guess, um, more successful and renowned um, uh, performances was at the Ilo Ilo Theatre, which is a building that's still standing in Cumberland. Um, but like many uh, Japanese, um, Eiko was interned, however, not in Canada. She was actually interned in Russia. Um, and um, then following the war, she went back to Japan and then she did come back to Canada just before her death. And when she did pass away, there was um, a big call within the Japanese community in Canada to say, that you know, she had come to Canada to say goodbye to us on her last trip. And so there was still very much this attachment um, to the strength that she had and the achievements that um, she was so successful with within the Canadian Japanese community.
here uh, that maybe these uniforms look a little familiar to some of you. I don't know if anyone was ever in brownies or in the girl guides, um, but Zella Apps was a strong community leader. Her husband, George Apps, was the principal of the Cumberland Elementary School um, for 38 years. And they were huge participants in the community. She was also part of the Trinity Anglican Church with, um, with Aunt Kay, Mrs. Finch. Uh, she was part of the Cumberland um, Folk Fest Society bringing that up. She also brought um, Empire Days and trained the May Queens. If you are unsure what Empire Days are or May Queens, please ask at the end. Kind of a fun little tidbit. Um, but one of the things I think that strikes me about Zella Apps and her husband George was the relationship that they built with the youth in the community. Um, and at the time of internment, they continued their relationship through penmanship and through letter writing with um, the Japanese students that were interned. And in the, for some of you who may not know, obviously a lot of the Japanese who were interned did not come back to Cumberland. So um, there was 42 families at the time of internment in the Japanese number one town that were forcibly removed. Um, and uh, George and Zella had been very close with, with those families. And so they continued writing. And in 1972, they were honored at the um, Japanese Cultural Center in Toronto by the Japanese community. Um, currently in the museum, we have a poster that has been signed by all of the um, Japanese who attended that ceremony as a thank you. Um, which had over 50 students um, in attendance from the time that uh, Zella and George had been involved in the community and that had, those who had been his students. So I think that really just shows, you know, the sort of strength of individuals working within the community and the impact um, that they had and what it takes to continue those relationships even through times of turmoil. Getting a little bit closer, we've got Ruth Masters. Some of you may or may not know who Ruth Masters is. Um, she was born in Comox, so she's not actually from Cumberland, um, but she was an activist, um, an environmental activist in the area. Uh, you can see a picture of her there. She joined the RCAF, uh, the Women's Division, in the Second World War. Uh, she was stationed in London, and she was an administrative sergeant, so she doesn't ever see the front lines. Um, but I think that gave her an interesting perspective on uh, fighting for Canada and fighting for the things that she believed in. Her father had also been a war veteran of the First World War. Um, they had a family property uh, near the Puntledge River, about 20 acres. And so she really grew up in the valley, really loving that. And one of the things that she became very involved was, was mountaineering. Anyone else do mountaineering? <laughs> um, maybe going out for lovely walks. But in uh, 1933, she uh, joined the Comox Regional District Mountaineering Club. Uh, with one of her really close friends. And <clears throat> she just never really stopped. And I think that's one of the things that she's known for was this fostered her love of the environment and wildlife. Um, and it wasn't a little bit until later in life and possibly her uh, professional life, she was a legal secretary for two different lawyers uh, in the Comox Valley until she retired. And then after she retired, she got a little caught up, you might wanna say, in some of the activism that was happening. Um, so in 1987, uh, Strathcona Park, maybe if you have, some of you have been there um, before, just on the other side of Mount Washington, uh, was threatened by um, a company who wanted to mine, uh, 
um, the fields. So they were going to strip down the forest and mine the fields. And um, I believe it was for silver. And this was something that she felt very strongly about. And so she joined this movement to save Strathcona Park. Um, the society still exists, the Strathcona Provincial, the Friends of Strathcona Park. And um, they were able to do that. And I think the success of that led to many other uh, endeavors in order to, um, for environmental activism. Um, there's, I think, some famous uh, instances wherein um, she's on her harmonica and she is playing Oh Canada while other activists are getting piled into um, the van um, police paddy wagons while uh, they were uh, lobbying uh, to uh, save Vancouver Island's old growth forests. So she was quite a woman um, that wasn't really gonna give up very easily. Um, this sort of gives you a little bit more of an insight into her. These are two pins that belonged to her. Um, and a picture of her from her early mountaineering days. Uh, we have both of those pins on exhibition at the museum right now. One of the other things that she did, um, that I just sort of think speaks to her character was she would give these hero spoon awards out to people in the community who she really felt had had a positive impact. So she was no longer just, you know, working for the community on things. She was empowering other people to for the things that they had done and for the impact that they were having. Um, she also really uh, cared about labor history, which the Cumberland Museum talks a lot about in our exhibitions, and uh, we hold a special place in Canadian history for that. And she created these scrapbooks um, of Ginger Goodwin. And so it was really interesting to see the, through her collecting um, as a museum professional, that tells you a lot about somebody and, and how they organize themselves. And so uh, she was quite Quite the individual. And in 20, uh, 2004, she actually gifted 18 acres of her property um, that's bordering the Puntledge River in the Comox Strathcona Regional District um, to become a greenway and a wildlife co corridor because she just couldn't take the logging anymore. She said it was going to be the death of her. Um, and so she wanted to make sure that that area was preserved for future generations. And so I think, you know, those are fairly selfless, um, selfless acts. She's also um, been acknowledged as Comox Valley's Citizen of the Year twice um, in 1985, and then again in 2005. So um, quite an amazing woman. Unfortunately, she did pass away in um, 2017 at the age of 97. And this is a horrible picture, I apologize, but I couldn't quite find a good one. Um, so this is, um, if you haven't had an opportunity, this is a wonder, really wonderful book. Um, it's called Dancing in Gumboots, and it's the second in a series. The first one talks about women who uh, moved to the Haida Gwaii and Prince Rupert area. Um, and this one talks about women in the Comox Valley. And I think it's a, it's a really interesting way to provide a transition from thinking about those early coal mining women who came and they were in this grit of a place. And then after the mines closed in Cumberland really went through another economic downturn. And you have this other new sort of wave of women that are coming in and looking at our community and seeing what do we need here? Um, and so they sort of label themselves as the first wave of feminist hippies who came into the valley in the 70s. And some of the things that they accomplished were really looking at the needs of a community and saying, what do we need? Um, so they developed food co-ops, uh, daycare and child development centers. Um, so I just, like, I think that that's, you know, really interesting. And Ann Davis is one of these women, she moved into Cumberland in 1974 um, 
and she bought a house on Camp Road, so where those very early miners were. And she has a, a quote here that I think is really interesting. She says, something important had happened in Cumberland and I needed to pay attention. Said the community of women in Comox Valley who were meeting together and sharing ideas and encouraging other. They were, um, you know, looking out to support each other in a time where there was a lot of economic challenges for women, um, especially single women. So a lot of them came as tree planters and they just looked for other ways in which they could support each other. So, and particularly, she um, provided shelter for women and families escaping domestic violence on Denman Island. And she was part of the initial group that created the Comox Valley Transition Society and Lily House um, for helping women uh, leave abusive situations. And she's been involved with union representation for health services associations, and she sits on the Labor Council as well. So Gloria Simpson is another one of our um, gumboot girls. Um, she came to Cumberland a little after in 1976. And um, I really, really like a quote that she has as well from this book. She says, Cumberland then was very quiet and run down. The last of the coal miners had closed about 10 years earlier and the population of the town had been shrinking. The town was impoverished, but it had many amenities left for when it was <clears throat> a booming company town, good schools, a good recreation center, a pharmacy and a health center. It had its own water system with water rights to five lakes above the town and the drinking water was delicious. There was a village park and a beach park at the lake close by. There was lots of empty lots, some empty houses and house prices were very low. People in the district scorned Cumberland for being economically depressed and rough, but I soon came to know it was in fact a place with a huge heart. It had an illustrious history in the labor movement and many of the residents lived there for generations. The solidarity in the community was very comforting. To me, it felt tribal. We were newcomers, but these working class historical socialist people were very tolerant and inclined to leave us alone and live and live as we liked. And I just think when we look at that initial comment John Belshoff from the beginning of the discussion, and we look at the, the situation at Cumberland that has really gone through this up and down period, these women coming into this economically depressed community and making um, it and building up on the strengths that they saw within it. And so I just think that's something quite special. To the last woman that I'd like to talk about tonight before I open up for questions is Mary Lynn Desroches. And I think this brings us into a contemporary narrative. So Mary Lynn um, is, um, lives in Cumberland, uh, still currently lives in Cumberland, and uh, was part of the Cumberland Community Forest Society. She was one of the founding members. And in sort of the um, late 90s, Cumberland decided to rebrand itself, rebrand itself as the community in the forest, which has a lovely ring to it, you know, moving away from this idea of this derelict coal mining town and rebranding and bringing in new people. And it is, it's surrounded by a gorgeous forest. That forest happens to be part of that original, original land grant that we talked about at the beginning. So it's actually all privately owned. And so this group of individuals said, well, they're about to mine this forest that's just outside of the, of the community. So they saw what was happening on Denman Island where the community was really uh, reaching out and acting together to try to purchase um, the area that was about to be logged. And so Lynn and the another a group of community members got together and created this not-for-profit society to help raise funds. And so they early on started to engage 
and understand really the limitations of how much was this going to cost them to buy a whole chunk of the forest and um and they had to come up with a million dollars and that was a really massive amount for a small community so they started small they had a plant sale um and uh that got them about, I think about $6,000. Okay, well, I think we might need to do more than this. And so Mary Lynn really believed in what the forest gave to the community and what the um, community need was for this. And so what she did was she actually remortgaged her house. And she uh, also put a loan out on her own personal company to the tune of $550,000, which was 50% of what they needed in order to purchase the land. And so over a five year period, they raised the rest of the money. And then on March 22nd, 2005, they were able to purchase um, the lot of land that they had been looking for, which is uh, now the, the Cumberland Forest, which was then gifted back to the community. Um, so, you know, I think from Diana Pickett providing a space for community for fundraising at the Cumberland Hall next to the Cumberland Hotel and um, sort of providing that atmosphere, this is just something that's in the roots of the Cumberland community of, of women standing up and uh, taking a leadership role. And I think that even stands now where we have had a um, female mayor for the last uh, more than 10 years. And um, I think those are, you know, really strong, strength, a lot of strengths about our, our community. So it is 747. So I think I'm a couple minutes over my time there, but I'm happy to take on any questions and I'll stop sharing my screen at this time. I think there's a question in the chat. Oh, yes. Yeah. Let's take a look at that. Here's the one. Uh, so the question reads, did they count the Chinese in the dead? Uh, yes, yes, they did. Um, so you can uh, see through Canadian census uh, that they uh, did, and they actually did a fairly good name for the most part of uh, recording the names of the Chinese. Sometimes we see in other areas where um, they will just count a number and not actually articulate the individual's name. Um, but in this case, they did within Cumberland. Yes, I, um, I, I know how brutally the Chinese were treated in the coal mines out here mm. and the same when they built the railroad. And uh, like, um, it sounds like a, quite a sophisticated mining town. Um, <laughs> did they not record the rough side of it? <laughs> like, Definitely. Who, who did the, what, were the native women the ones that were used in the brothels? Um, like like some of the early history, I think Wendy it was in your book that you gave us at book club one day that talked about how brutally the Asian women were treated down in in uh, Victoria. Um, so I guess there was a part of me that did they not record it or or did that not happen there? I think we didn't have quite as much of the same type of um, like it was a little bit more segregated, uh, the communities themselves in Cumberland. So we can talk about, um, there's, you can paint a nice picture of how these communities got along, but there was still a lot of racism. So even though maybe Mrs. Finch was working within the communities, I'm sure that there was a lot of challenges at that time. There were not a lot of Chinese women in the early years in Cumberland. Um, and the Chinese population in Cumberland at its uh, height was about 3,000. So it would have been larger mm -hmm. in Victoria um, at, that, at that time. And you would have had more women going through there. You wouldn't have had so many women, uh, specifically Chinese women, uh, who weren't actually attached to somebody 
they they weren't just traveling there for very um, little. There was usually an end point, an end game. So either they were marrying a gentleman within the community or um, going up further abroad, but it wasn't a very easy place to get to. Um, Victoria was the stopping point for a Chinese immigration where they would stay and sort of actually be sequestered when they first came in uh, and then moved on. So was Nanaimo Mines before or after Cumberland? Before. The Wellington Mines were in operation prior to the Cumberland Mines. And that's where Dunsmuir made a significant amount of money. And he was actually able to buy um, the, the rights from some of the, from the, Union Coal Company was actually started in 1869, not by Dunsmuir, but they had no money to get a coal mining operation off the ground. And so Dunsmuir bought out all of the partners from that. Okay. Yeah. 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 I guess probably they don't want to probably talk too much about the seedy side of things. Like, was it the first, was it the First Nations of ladies that took the root of the the sexual exploitation, um, because it would have been. Like, I think we're burying our head in the sand if we said there wasn't. um, Well, I think that when you think about Cumberland specifically, there wasn't an Indigenous settlement in Cumberland. Cumberland is known as the way between. So that if you were going to be seeing that type of thing, you would have seen it more towards Courtney and Comox. Yeah, like that wasn't the the first husband. Didn't he go to, was it... Royston, you said? Yes, yeah, yeah. That's pretty close, yeah. Mm -hmm. So that, so his brothel probably was full of First Nations. Potentially, um, from, I'm not as, um, I have much knowledge about that here, but I do know from uh, my past job in Vancouver, a lot of those women were also industrious and they actually came up from the States. Um, So you still, you had a lot of, uh, white women working in brothels, even married women, uh, making money on the side. Okay. Yeah. That, thanks. Yeah, no problem. I, I just kind of liked it. I guess maybe I, a little <laughs> so more action. I was talking about the seedy <laughs> side of things. <laughs> can I just join, can I just jump in there? I know there's another question too coming, but um, just thinking about Dunsmuir and the fact that he was, um, supposedly a very ruthless businessman who had absolutely no, um, he had no sympathy for any kind of unionism and that he preferred to have Chinese workers to white people because the white people who came over from Britain would unionize and he was completely ruthless with them and they lost their jobs. But what I would like to know, and I know that um, it was very interesting to hear about all the individual women, but thinking about the Crow's Nest Pass strike, the miners' strike there in 1932, there must have been strikes in Cumberland. And did the women play any part in the strikes in terms of communally banding together? Yes. Uh, So the big strike that happened in Cumberland was in 1917 and 19, just uh, 1912 to 1917, and where the miners um, stopped working. So I think there's one thing to sort of remember when we talk about like the Dunsmuir family, um, Robert Dunsmuir actually died the year that the Cumberland mines opened. So he, uh, he wasn't responsible, but his son James was, um, who then became premier of, of the um, province. And one of the things that happened during that strike period was initially the Chinese workers joined with the uh, workers of European descent to strike. But what had been happening and in other places in British Columbia, in the non-Dunsmere mines, there had been legislation that Chinese people couldn't work underground. But um, the Canadian Collieries Company for which James Dunsmere owned they paid the fines to allow the Chinese workers. So it was still more economically efficient for them to pay the fines to allow the Chinese workers to work underground with lower wages. And so they didn't actually participate in the strike and people were brought in as strike breakers. So 
one of the challenges for the workers in the Cumberland mines during the strike period was that the Cumber the mines were still actually functioning because they were continually bringing in strike breakers and um, people wouldn't even know like the other European um, miners would be coming in and being brought in and wouldn't know that they were walking into a community that is on strike. And so because they were still actually making money at the mines, the they didn't really get anywhere um, with their strike. And so when the, um, when the American Mine Workers Union ran out of money, essentially, at the beginning of the uh, First World War, or at the end of the First World War, sorry, they had to go back to work. And some of them were then banned and couldn't find work um, at that point. So it was quite a bit earlier than the 1932. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I'm just kind of going on on a, a gentleman who had, who had studied Dunsmuir a lot and it was about at least 10 years before we retired out here and we were out uh, and visiting the Dunsmuir Castle just as they were starting to restore it on an Easter holiday. And just this gentleman, he was an older retired man, but he took great glee in, in giving us a lot of background. And he talked about, I think it would have been the Nanaimo mines, which is before that, and how <laughs> a lot of the, the Chinese seas would just be blown up in the tunnels and they wouldn't even record the deaths or the numbers, et cetera. Mm. And then he had to point out that but go down to the town and see how many Chinese names are on doctors and lawyers and dentists and see if you can find a Dunsmuir name. <laughs> <laughs> and he, was, he took great um, um, joy in pointing that out, that the, the Chinese did survive in spite of the many, many hardships throwing at, thrown at yeah. them. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's really important to remember that in, the, in this idea of, thinking about the resilience that different communities have had um, over time, especially the Chinese community. When yeah. we even um, look at, I mentioned Jack Chow, who was a Chow Lee, um, one of the women who I talked about, it was his uh, mother, dear she, and they went on and they moved to Vancouver after uh, most of the family. And if, you've ever been to Vancouver and you've been into Chinatown, you've probably seen Jack Chow and like bright yeah. lights all over. And, um, you know, that's that family is from Cumberland and he was a large insurance broker. And uh, Wu Fun Sen also was the unofficial mayor of, of Vancouver. And he was born in Cumberland and he was an activist. And he went through sort of what you were talking about before this early sort of stopover in Victoria <laughs> And he'd had his head shaved and been felt like he was not even a human being. And he was placed yeah. there for a week, a week um, before he was allowed to come and meet his father, who was in Cumberland working in the mines. And that just spurred him to become an activist for the Chinese community. Um, yeah, so it, it is really interesting yeah. sort Thank of the things yeah. that affect yeah. individuals that, that yeah. bring us to yeah. So I, we've got a question from Diane in the chat, so I thought okay. I'd bring her up. Thank you, uh, Victoria. Yeah, I, uh, I know that the Chinese were allowed to have more than one wife in, in you know, back home in China, and you mm -hmm. mentioned a second wife, and I was wondering, was that a, a, at the same time as the first wife? And if so, how did the Caucasians feel about that? I can imagine that they didn't take well um, to oh, that. It okay. um, was more than one wife. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So uh, for um, Chao Fang Gar, he had uh, two wives at the same time in Canada, where uh, Chao Li only had one. Unfortunately, uh, he did have three wives, but the other two died um, prior to the third one coming or each okay. one coming. Yeah, huh. and, and nobody, nobody fussed about that. I mean, legally, nobody said anything either, you know? Well, no, um, and it wasn't only like in Cumberland, it was in other places as well. And yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. The movie is called Save Space Nugget. Let's see if I can just put a link into the chat for you. I'll just see if I can find my but 
we were always always told that the Chinese, if they could pr- say to the immigration department that they that it was a wife, they had a lot better chance of bringing them over, and so they'd use a lot of wife um, <laughs> inventions, and so that is how they often brought relatives, etc., to Canada. Mm-hmm. They might not have been legally a wife, but they called them a wife. Yes. Yep. That happened. And if you could pay a certain amount, but it was very expensive. And that happened not very often in a place like Cumberland okay. and places like Cumberland, you really had, it was very hard to get to. So I think there's no railway system that is coming yet up to Cumberland. So when you're coming, you're coming from Victoria then you're coming up, you're coming by boat to Union Bay, and then you're having to trek from Union Bay into Cumberland. Cause yeah, you think yeah, right. yeah. at that time, even Courtney and Comox, Cumberland is a larger community than those two areas. They are mainly agricultural and fishing communities. Okay, right. thank you. Yeah. 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 Interesting. Yeah, they're very different than the city element. Yeah. I believe this is the link for Sharon, that are you satisfied? Do you have your? Oh, I I just wanted to say I um, when we visit Cumberland, we enjoy it so much, and and <laughs> we did see Space Nugget, and uh, so appreciate the community. Could you, could you talk a bit about the culture now there? It, it seems to be um, very much a tourist area when we go in the summertime. Oh, it's nice, yeah. Yeah, of course. Just making sure I have the right link for you there. Um, yeah, the community now, is, it was actually a really interesting uh, experience. I actually don't live in Cumberland. I live in Nunus. <laughs> so I'm on the <laughs> other side of things. Um, so I found it really interesting um, sort of going into that community to work. And uh, when, of course, I started at the pandemic. Uh, So the museum closed on March 17th, 2020, and I had my first day the following week. Uh, So it was a, you know, sort of a a neat community to (laughs) come into, but then the support that I've seen so far from that, and we did a little bit of um, a visitor study and visitor investigation in the community when we decided to rebuild the exhibitions, we said, well, who is our community now and who is our audience? And so I think that really speaks to your question because we had to think, well, who are we making these exhibits for? It's not really a coal mining town anymore. And we're... <laughs> yeah. Sorry, and then... Um, so I do think that we have a lot of, you know, young families moving into the community now and people sort of escaping Vancouver and you really have um, a change in demographics. So when we look at the entirety of the Comox Valley, medium age is roughly around 60 and in Cumberland it's 39. Um, so it's really different and so people, the, the things that are drawing people to the community is the forest, is the recreation activities. And so as a little museum in that community, we have to think about, okay, well, you know, how are we going to share the wealth of history from our community, as well as engage with the community that is coming here now? And and so one of the new things that we did in the exhibit is we actually are have a whole uh, hallway dedicated to land use and the overlapping values that we place on the land, everything from extraction to recreation and play to cultural resources with the Comox First Nation and the treatment of individuals in Chinatown and Japanese town and then and the watersheds. So um, it's really an interesting breadth of things. We'd love to model ourselves after your community. (laughs) If only we could go back in age, Sherry. Okay, and uh, Jacqueline, you had your hand raised? Yes, oh, hi. Uh, yes, I've been to the uh, Cumberland uh, Museum there with the, uh, I mean, you can actually take part in walking through a coal mine, which I think is incredible what you've done mm-hmm. there. Um, I'm just going to say that my partner's mom, uh, she was born in Bevan. And, <laughs> uh, yes, and then they moved to Cumberland and uh, she became a nurse and she worked in the hospital there. Mm-hmm. Her last name is Vale. Uh, first name is Myrtle. Myrtle Vale at mm-hmm. V-A-H-L-E. A family there, you know, yeah. like you. And um, 
Um, she's buried near in the, in the Cumberland Cemetery, two sort of two over from Ginger Goodwin. So oh, great. we go there a fair bit to, yes. to say hello and <laughs> whatever. But uh, also May Day, you have uh, something on May 1st, right? A big event on May 1st, I believe. Yes. Yeah. So I just make two really quick comments. So the hospital is really interesting um, that you mentioned that and I, um, both Diana Pickett and uh, Zella Apps worked with the Ladies Auxiliary. And so the Cumberland Hospital was also born out of a community need. And so you had minors getting injured and there was no real um, hospital or physician. And so James Dunsmere donated the land and the timber and the coal to run the hospital. But it was the miners who decided to essentially create kind of like a co-op where they all paid into it. Um, and then you had um, up until 1974 is when the hospital uh, was around until, and it was actually the only hospital in the Comox Valley that uh, was not run by uh, religious organizations. And it was one of the only places at that time that uh, women could get any type of uh, female sexual health um, uh, help or practice or um, for that wow. type of thing. Wow. That's, that's wow. interesting. Yeah. Oh, what a place. <clears throat> I forget what the other question might have been. Sorry. <laughs> I think it's Eva. E Eva? Eva? Do you, do you want to unmute yourself, Eva? <laughs> yeah. Careful. Oh, can't she? Oh, yeah. Eva? Well, she can't hear us. Hi. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but you did have the May Day celebrations, which you focused on uh, yeah. the Oriental uh, uh, deal. And uh, so, uh, but also at that time, the little cabins and, and cottages that the uh, Orientals lived in mm -hmm. uh, could not be changed. Is that still in effect? The, you know, the facade could not be changed. Um, I don't know if I heard the very beginning of your question. Sorry, so oh. uh, the Chinatown uh, no longer exists. So there are no buildings left in Chinatown. It's uh, well, say, because it was uh, the, uh, the council uh, in back in 85 had declared that the facade of these cottages that the uh, miners lived in could not be changed. So yeah, so the uh, it's kind of an interesting when you look at heritage infrastructure. So Cumberland itself, so if you think about Victoria or you think about Vancouver, we actually have heritage registries. And so a building would be put on a registry and then there are extra sort of measures that one needs to go through in order to make an alteration to those buildings. Mm -hmm. So those, those uh, cabins up on camp, Camp Road, that were the original miners' cabins, definitely um, people have made alterations to those and there's not any real protection council can create kind of a, a bylaw but it's very hard to enforce if you actually don't have a proper heritage registry uh, which cumberland does not have so a developer could go in um, yeah mm -hmm. okay thank you very much for an exciting and very interesting presentation, Rosalyn. Uh, it's just been a fabulous time. Uh, I, are there any more questions? Otherwise, maybe we'll take our regular break. I'll stop the recording. And Rosalyn, I'll get in touch with you to see if you want to put any links to the museum on the recording. And okay. I'll show you where the recording will live on YouTube for you. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for having me this evening. And uh, I wish you best of luck. And I hope please come visit the museum. And um, I will share with uh, Sonia and with Victoria some digital passes. And anyone who was at tonight's presentation could uh, come, come down and visit us next time you're in town for free. 
Yes, beautiful so place. Nice. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you so much. Have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you.